Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bitcoin News Hour, brought to you by Cafe Bitcoin, the most active Bitcoin club on Clubhouse. During the Bitcoin News Hour, we will cover all the latest headlines in Bitcoin. But this isn't your normal network news show where they talk and you just listen. Today's headlines will be presented and discussed by you, the members of Cafe Bitcoin. To participate in the Bitcoin News Hour, simply change your avatar to the headline you'd like to talk about. Today's moderators will then bring you up from the audience. You'll get one to two minutes to introduce the headline and give everyone the gist of the story. And then everyone will discuss the news before we move on to the next headline. Now, before we get started, do us a favor and click the plus sign at the bottom right of your screen to invite anyone you know who might enjoy this show. And if you're new to Cafe Bitcoin, click on Cafe Bitcoin at the top left and join the club. You can also visit CafeBitcoin.club to find our full schedule of events, as well as a fantastic list of beginner Bitcoin resources. And now, get your headlines ready, because it's time for the Bitcoin News Hour. Welcome, everybody. You heard Brecky. Game's pretty simple. Let's catch up on the Hey, that announcer guy. Sounds like he's a, a good-looking, smart fellow, if I do say so myself. Is, is he single, by chance? <laughs> he, he is single. He is single. But uh, we're here for the Bitcoin News Hour, so let's get to it. I think we just made some Bitcoin <laughs> news. Doing, Bricky, do you want to kick us off today, man? I'm so excited. We had a pretty, uh, pretty wild weekend with a lot of twists and turns, and maybe no one exactly knows why. So let's get started, if you don't mind. Definitely. So uh, for my headline, and please PTR, pull down to refresh, uh, OKEX goes live with Bitcoin Lightning Network deposits and withdrawals. Uh, the Lightning Network, for those who don't know, is a second layer that works atop Bitcoin to facilitate faster and cheaper transaction, transactions than Bitcoin's primary network. Uh, and the exchange announced the integration in February. I'll read their, their little press release here. OKEX is pleased to announce that BTC Lightning Network is now live on the OKEx website, enabling much faster and cheaper BTC transfers. OKEx users are now able to use the Lightning Network for both deposits and withdrawals. Um, this uh, There's not too much to this, but it's just super bullish, uh, especially days like these where, uh, you know, the fee market is a bit is a bit wild and uh, you just love to see continued lightning adoption. Uh, more recently, for those who have been paying attention, um, the number of nodes on the lightning network actually doubled to around, I think, over 10,000 now. So uh, lightning is growing. It's awesome. I just uh, got another node set, set up the other day. And if anybody's interested in setting up a lightning node, I am no expert, but DM me and I can send you some great resources. So Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Lightning Network. I think those who continue to interact with the Lightning Network see the magic and the possibilities. Um, I run a, an Umbral node, so certainly a big fan. You want to open up a channel sometime, Brecky? Yeah, man, let's do it. All right. Well, yeah, Brecky, do you know when the fee's cool? Do you know which exchanges now? And can you rattle off some that support Lightning? Uh, let's see if it has it here. Uh, others include OKCoin, Bitfinex, River. Uh, Kraken is expected later this year, and I'm not sure about the others. I think there might be a few uh, smaller exchanges that uh, that offer it. Yeah, those are the big names. Pretty stoked. Anybody else want to weigh in? How many folks on stage are running their own uh, Lightning Node? And the I am not. But, you know, um, at, I was at the Bitcoin dev uh, meetup this weekend and I let I let a friend stay at um, one of my empty apartments on downtown. And when he left, he asked to send he wanted to send me Satoshis and he asked for a lightning address. And I'm planning to, to set one up. But is the lightning address different? Like, do, do I have to run a node to have an address? Uh, it depends. I mean, there there are plenty of, of custodial Lightning wallets that you can use, and I use them for different things. Um, but, you know, in a non-custodial way, you'll have to have your own node. That's fair. Yeah, but, I mean, you can download, you know, Moon or Balloon Wallet, and he can still send you sats. It's just 
you know, you're not going to own it. Um, and then you can run your node later and catch up. But yeah, Umbral is pretty good, an easy way to, to get it running. If I can do it, anybody can. Aaron, what do you got for us, man? Thanks for joining. And thanks for almost joining me for the whole fact. <laughs> I'll get you next time. All right. So China is seeking to allay fears that it wants to topple the U.S. dollar as the world's main reserve currency. Beijing is making strides in creating its own digital yuan. People Bank of China Deputy, Deputy Governor Li Bo said the goal for internationalizing its currency is not to replace the dollar and efforts to create a digital yuan are aimed at domestic use. Quote, for internationalization of the renminbi, we have said many times that it's a natural process and our goal is not to replace the U.S. dollar or other international currencies. Uh, the governor at least said at a panel, I think our goal is to allow the market to choose to facilitate international trade and investment. The People Bank of China has been working on a digital currency since 2014, rolling out a trial for consumers in 11 cities across the country. Um, so there it is. Um, great words. Um, not a lot of substance. What can we Hey John, let's uh, let's invite a few commentators up uh, for today. I just saw let's that Jeet me scan the the room. Love to love to hey, bring him up. What's up, Jeet? Up for it. It's been a while. Yeah, what's up, man? It's good to see you. Hey, what's up, guys? Chris, P, come on up. Awesome. I just thought my headline was funny and ironic and obviously uh, two faced, <laughs> but. Very funny that they are um, doing interviews with Bloomberg to assure everyone that it has absolutely nothing to do whatsoever in any way with the U.S. dollar. <laughs> uh, we'll see. I mean, the Bank of England announced some stuff on the CBDC. They're basically leading um, some exploratory discussions and starting to put some resource behind it. So you're seeing more and more central banks like starting to make discussions around technology. But hey, welcome, Jeep, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, Brecky, John, I didn't know, realize you guys were going to bring me on stage. I actually came to like l learn about what's going on in the news. I'll try to chime in if I can. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I don't know what you guys have discussed already, so I'll just listen in for a little bit before I chime in. But I, you know, I've said this so many times. I feel like the pace of events is, uh, you know, getting beyond our ability to understand. Yeah, man, it's part of why we started this uh, cheat session hour. I mean, the Bitcoin news hour where like we can all just kind of like get the TLDR and a bunch of articles because uh, bull run news is like seven days in one. And man, it's hard to keep your head straight, right, with all the stuff you got going on in, in life. So, yeah, man, tune in and feel free to jump in. Man. It's good. Yeah. On that note with the China story, did you guys hear that they also came out and said Bitcoin is an actual store of value now for the first time? China is freaking bipolar. I did see that. Yeah, I mean, you'd love to see it, but uh, you know, we'll see how long the position holds. I think Silva's story has to do with that, so she'll be talking about it a little. Oh, perfect. Silva, do you want to go ahead? Hey, Silva, feel free if you want to chime in. Not sure if you're there, but just because your story is related, man, I'd love to give you the floor. Yeah, sorry about that. It's uh, basically the same kind of uh, tone as Aaron's story, just basically saying that they're now calling it an investment alternative. Hey, folks, also a quick reminder, if you can, um, if you're sharing a story, if you could please drop the link to that story in the companion Telegram chat, we'd really appreciate it. Trying to get everyone in the habit of Yeah, sure, we will do. Thanks for the reminder. And while we're there, just because I know we've had a lot of people join the room, one, feel free to ping in some friends. Um, I know this is the uh, cheat hour, what I like to call the Bitcoin news hour. Simply put, this is audience participation. If you read something today that's relevant to Bitcoin, think it's worth sharing change your avatar to the headline of that story come on up raise your hand we'll get you up tell the story in about one or two minutes or at least the key points we'll discuss it as a group for about three or four minutes hopefully we'll cover about 10 or 12 stories and get caught up on the news in one hour um, without having to read everything in the uh in the in the news sphere so frankie do you want to you want to go ahead and take on over and 
Sure. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, my story is about how the United Kingdom government just established a central bank di digital currency task force. And um, what this mean means basically is that the Bank of England and Her Majesty's Treasury, they've basically just kind of come together and created a task force to coordinate the uh, exploration of what a national digital currency could be like. And so, you know, the goal of this task force is to gather all of the efforts of any relevant statutory body in the UK regarding the potentiality of creating a central bank digital currency. So I think this is very exciting, just like another indication of um, the UK's government's focus on digital currencies and fintech in general. Frankie, does the article mention uh, whether or not the Queen's face will be on those, uh, those digital cards? <laughs> it's a, uh, it's part of the exploratory committee. They're, they're trying to, <laughs> to, to waver a, uh, a, a constitutional am amendment in their parliament. But I'd love to get the, uh, the overall take from the, from the group um, on what CBCD adoption and all of the announcements that um, seem semi innocuous on some level, but also seem kind of astonishing if you looked at this from like a 2017, 2018 level. I'm certainly not trying to compare the 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 monetary um, um, discussion in comparison to Bitcoin, but rather the technology and wide widespread adoption and use um, forced by governments to start getting used to using digital money, wallets, etc. Um, um, any thoughts on that in, in terms of you know the the, the rapid announcements and, and contributed discussions, uh, whether it's the Bank of England, China, uh, even the United States. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting question, John, because I just realized that my story was not exactly about Bitcoin. But um, you're right, you know, like the these sort of stories are popping up everywhere. And the truth is, is that, you know, governments are looking at crypto, at digital currencies to become like part of their stable coin regulation and I think it's it's really interesting that um, we're you know we're we're watching it. If you look if you look at a dollar bill there or a hundred dollar bill, there's a bunch of numbers on it, and all we're doing is putting that on the blockchain. Yeah, you're going to hear more about these CBDCs, especially going into the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, where they're going to endlessly promote this as the first major CBDC. Overall, I think it's just going to educate people about what crypto is generally. Hopefully that leads them into Bitcoin and not into all of the crap coins, including CBDCs. I think it'll just generally increase awareness about the industry. Um, China, of course, despite what it says, is absolutely trying to attract foreign ownership of its CBDC and all, also its stocks. Bloomberg noted today, 95% of uh, Chinese stocks are owned domestically, 98% of uh, Chinese bonds are owned domestically, so they want foreign people to buy them. So if they can facilitate that through CBDC, the same is true of the um, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank. Every you know bank wants to facilitate international ownership of its local assets to attract you know investment and ownership of uh, from other people. So that's what the story is really about. But hopefully, it leads education into Bitcoin. Let's move on. Shelly, welcome back. What's up, sis? Good afternoon. What you got for us? I want to so, look. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't find a, a, a funny Bitcoin story today. So I'm going to be serious. Face. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so the story that I found was regarding a, an ETF from Canada and uh, they were, 18 days ago, they were on their final prospectus today. They uh, announced the release of the fourth um, ETF in Canada. So they are definitely leading the way since we still haven't re approved any applications here in the United States. So for anyone who wants to take part it the ticker symbol is btcq in canadian dollars and btcq.u for uh u.s dollars and uh pretty much that's it 
Yeah, I think it's a uh, pretty interesting, and I think a lot of people are uh, are pretty eager to see what an ETF means in the U.S. And gee, man, we haven't really talked about this in in a, in, in a while. And I, if you're busy, by all means, I'll, I'll take silence. But we'd love to get your take on what an ETF means for for Bitcoin um, um, broadly. And and I have some thoughts, but I don't want to pollute them for you. Yeah, I think the so my understanding is the biggest change in terms of the like an ETF. Uh, is just going to be like uh, an increased number of people who can access it. So if you think about most people, they don't have like a ton of just cash sitting in their account. Like, well, so, okay, here, here's how I think about it. Um, you know, there are people who have different levels of savings in America. The biggest, the kind of biggest pool of savings in my mind outside of like companies and stuff for just individuals is people with who work at companies or who work for the government who have uh, retirement accounts. So they've got like a 401k and a Roth IRA and um, that money, you know, especially for like the 401k um, it's, it's very limited in what you can invest. So you can invest in things like index funds or I, I mean, it, for the Roth, you can invest in individual stocks. Um, but that's where most people have their money. Um, and so like for those guys, you can't like, I mean, the, the process for buying Bitcoin through those accounts is either non-existent or extremely difficult. Uh, it, what an ETF does is it turns Bitcoin from this like esoteric finance, uh, esoteric um, cryptocurrency into a ticker. So like, you know, when when your like, you know, uh, older uncle who's like a retired engineer says, how do I buy Bitcoin? You don't need to tell them to like, OK, first you download Cash App and then, you know, hook up your bank account. You just tell them like, oh, just buy the ticker, you know, BTC um, in your Fidelity account or your Vanguard account. So there's uh, what, what will happen is it's basically like in, in business terms, you have a total addressable market. It expands your total addressable market from like, early, like, you know, cypherpunks, early adopters, weirdos <laughs> like us, uh, college students. And it expands it into like people with like, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in their bank account. Um I need to do more research because I, I do remember and I've got it written down somewhere about how gold um, kind of flipping the switch on their ETF did expand that market as well. Uh, but I don't know much about that. I can tell you um, like for the real estate market in the nineties ish, they, they turned uh, REITs or real estate investment trusts from a really esoteric thing into like, they, they made this whole organization and this effort to turn it into like a proper asset class and, you know, in early 1990s, like people laughed at them, like people who buy real estate are like doctors. They own like two buildings. That's not comparable to a company. But today there's, you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, um, like individual managers of like tens of billions of dollars of real estate. So it's a very real asset class. If you go to like JP Morgan's uh, quarterly, you know, uh, I forgot what it's called exactly, but it's like a quarterly investor update they provide. Um Real estate investment trust is listed as one of those things. And so all I think all ETF is going to do, increase that total addressable market and then kind of make it more of like an embedded part of the financial system. So the next time they have one of these like reports, Bitcoin gets listed like alongside everything else. And um, I saw on Twitter today, actually, I think it's one of those big investment banks has like a report on, you know, which assets outperformed this week. And they've started including Bitcoin on that uh, in that analysis. So it's going to be, you know, it's it's just about um, mind share. Like so, instead of market share, we've got a mind share thing. ETF basically expands the mind share. So, um, yeah, I'd be here, curious to hear other people's thoughts. I'm, I'm sure Bruce probably has a more like uh, accurate opinion, but that's just me. So uh, I uh, yeah, go ahead, Frankie. And I just wanted to welcome uh, Bruce. Bruce, we we're just talking a little bit about what an ETF would mean to Bitcoin, and we're just jumping in. Um, Frankie, please feel free to jump in. And Bruce, if you have any thoughts. Hey, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, hey, I actually actually um, kind of covered this story when Grayscale wanted to turn uh, their fund into like an ETF. I have like a one minute video on this on my Instagram page. But basically, an ETF stands for exchange traded funds. And it basically mimics the price of Bitcoin, the asset, allowing investors to buy into the ETF without ever needing to trade or buy Bitcoin itself. And the reason why this is important is because investing in a Bitcoin ETF basically cuts out any issues of like the challenging storage and security precautions required by 
um, investors who are, you know, investing into Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely, Frankie. Um, you know, I, I would just add to what Jeet's saying and, and feel free for anyone else on stage to chime in. But I've been making the case that like that for me is the next big, big shoe to drop, not whether or not Walmart or Amazon or whoever buys Bitcoin and puts it on their treasury and, you know, a few billion dollars. But, you know, Jeet, Jeet kind of highlighted the case when like ETFs come into the market, the total addressable market goes up. Bitcoin's risk portfolio continues to go down. Um, it's now able to be included in 401k plans. And now you got this just like wall of money where people have limited choices. People have no attachment to Vanguard, but people have already kind of focused, you know, budgeted in that five, six, 10, 20% of their, uh, of their wages into a 401k or an IRA. And so when you see that wall of money continue to go through, I think there is a cyclical effect. I think there is a domino effect. Um, where the it becomes less and less risky, so more and more institutional dollars can go in, and then you have f further continual wall of money that just comes in passively, you know, through 401k plans of the average Accenture employee and the average Chase employee, for that matter, perhaps even who knows. Um, but you know, just that that's where I think like the ETFs and uh, um, these types of more like you know de-risked offerings, if you will, and more you know frictionless offerings to, to I think how you describe it, G really means for, for Bitcoin market share. Um, I remember Kathy Wood at ARC talked about an ETF making most, most sense around $2 trillion. That's roughly $100,000 Bitcoin. I think, you know, with folks that I've talked to empirically, and this is totally anecdotally, but folks that I know that, you know, either run family offices or involved in family offices, some folks that I know at large companies involved in treasury, like the asset looks a lot different than 100K. I mean, they're not buying relatively that much less Bitcoin um, at 100K as much as they're covering their ass and being able to protect their job and, and ultimately make a much less risky decision for their businesses and so, or their, their investment fund or their, their institution. And so I just think it looks a lot different as, and it gains more momentum, which allows for it to gain even more momentum. And this becomes a more exponential impact. So I'm really excited to see what happens with the US ETF. Hey, Bruce, just because you're here, we got to, we at least have to have you say, no, I have nothing to say, but would love to. <laughs> No, I agree. I think the ETF is huge. You know, it's um, crypto is still a very small piece of the overall financial markets. And the, those financial markets have all kinds of hooks and rails and stuff that have been going for 85 years and they just work. And, um, you know, they don't always work right. They're certainly not perfect. There's a lot of improvements we can make, but that's just how it works. And that's where the money is. It's like, it's like saying, you, you know, you invent a you know, some kind of new car that doesn't need wheels, but you still have roads. And that that's sort of the way the financial market is. Um, so Bitcoin hasn't been a part of that. You have to go to sort of a weird procedure and go to these, you know, they're not as weird now. Coinbase is still pretty mainstream, but it's not like part of the system. It's not Charles Schwab. It's not Fidelity. It's not E-Trade. It's a different thing that sits over by itself. It's not in the network with regular brokers and, and all of these things. Because of that, you have, you know, your typical family office, your regular investor, your 401k investor, your middle class people, your rich people, they all have market on these, you know, they all have money in these old rails. You know, these, they have money in brokerages. Um, every, every 401k there is pretty much is almost all of them are with a brokerage of some form or they're with a, an insurance company, but typically they're with a brokerage that has something like mutual funds and family offices. All of them have, you know, all the ones I know of, I'm, I'm sure, you know, 99%, they have some kind of rails into brokerages. They, you know, they open accounts at JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or, you know, whatever. And um, so it's a big, big chunk of the world's money. I mean, it's just so much more money than what we have. And, and also just the systems for people at family offices to just track the stuff. And it sounds like a, like a funny problem to have. And people in crypto particularly can't relate to it. But the higher up the food chain you go with that money, the harder it is for them to track all of their different investments. You know, if you have $100 billion, you know, you, you may have 800 allocations, you know, or if, even if you have $10 billion, you may have hundreds of allocations. And that's a pain. You know, they, it's quarterly meetings and shareholder meetings. And, you know, your, your schedule can get very full just getting basic updates. So to have something that's a little more on the rails and on the system that you'll be able to buy, like you can buy Tesla stock, it's a game changer. I think it's huge. So I think you'll have a lot of money flow into these funds. And uh, it just gets people asking about it, talking about it, it makes it more of 
you know, considered by the traditional financial system to be a regular asset right right alongside gold and stuff. So I, I think it's it's not the end all be all. I mean, eventually, hopefully that will be obsolete, but it's certainly, um, you know, maybe a while and you could you could have be do quite well. You could have it, you know, really, really do well uh, for a while. It could be an important part of the narrative going forward. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bruce. I couldn't agree more. And I appreciate you sharing that 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 uh, unique perspective. Um, it's probably a good time to reset here. Um, this is the Bitcoin News Hour. Um, we will share about 10 to 12 news stories. Audience participation is mandatory. We um, will try to cover, like I said, 10 to 12 news stories. The way we'll do that is if you've read a cool story, a relevant story, something you want to share for the news of the day, perhaps the weekend with all the news that have come through, what you can do is change your headline excuse me, your avatar to the headline that you've read, raise your hand, come on stage, um, share what you've learned in about one or two minutes, and then we can um, discuss in three or four minutes. Man, we got to turn off all those uh, telegram uh, 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 notifications. Those are those are quite distracting, but um, That's all me. joking aside. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, hey, Brecky, I, I, I hear you, brother. No worries. All joking. Um, quickly, PTR, you'll, uh, you'll see Brecky's uh, – uh, uh, Brecky's instructions, change your profile picture to a headline, raise your hand, come up and teach us in about one or two minutes, and we'll try to get this done in about an hour so not everybody has to read everything. Frankie, thanks for sharing your story. Shelly, thank you for sharing your story. Travis, is that a story or is that a, uh, is there something you want to teach us behind? So that's a, it's a YouTube video. Uh, Kathy Wood did another interview uh, with Saul, Oh, is that Kathy? Uh, last week. Kathy Wood? Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. So, uh, but this, this little clip just hit my, my wall today and I've, I've got a two minute audio. If you guys are okay with me playing it, go for it. So, yes. We think it's an asset class. We think Bitcoin itself, uh, will, uh, I was quoted in some paper. I never said this, but, uh, someone did some homework and added, uh, what I was saying up and said, uh, you know, Ark thinks this is a $10 trillion opportunity when it came to Bitcoin. And I said, I never said that, but I, I did actually say it uh, with the building blocks. We think institutional could be, um, could institutional going to say five or 6% of institutional portfolios, again, very low correlation. Um, and that's sort of where real estate and emerging markets went. Uh, mm -hmm. That would add $500,000 uh, to Bitcoin's price. So Right there, uh, that's a, a nearly a tenfold increase. If you look at uh, playing the role of cash on the balance sheet, which is we did not incorporate this into our institutional white paper because we didn't expect it, to be honest. Uh, but now we see Square and Tesla and MicroStrategy. Uh, they have diversified some in the case of Square and uh, Tesla. It's 5 and 8% respectively. Uh, MicroStrategy, it's 100% of their cash in Bitcoin. Um, so if you, if, you, if you were to expect 1% uh, 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 if corporations did that, I think this is just a U.S. calculation too, that would be a 40,000 increase uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, if it's 10%, closer to where Tesla is, uh, that would be a $400,000 increase in the price. So Again, uh, another eightfold increase. So, and those are just two use cases. I mean, the biggest use case is an insurance policy for anyone in the world, uh, you know, to protect against confiscation of wealth. And I just, I thought that was incredibly interesting. It's the first time I'd seen it. So I, uh, that was my little article. I just hear, I, I, I love Kathy Wood. I get weak. Oh, was that Kathy Wood? That was <laughs> Yeah, I, I put her Kathy Woods uh, pinwheel of fortune on my profile as an homage to her calculations and numbers. Yeah, she is amazing. She's awesome. So, uh, so anyway, so that popped up on my wall today. I think it's from a a talk that she did on the twelfth, and it's just a, a clip. So what I think is interesting is is that she's been projecting all this stuff since since last year, but but she didn't incorporate any of the micro strategy uh, cash reserve issue so it's interesting to hear her adjust her projection anybody have any insights that are probably not as brilliant as cat we have a humble 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 group of moderators just a quick thank you for all the moderators and contributors brecky always appreciate your my partner in crime aaron frankie shelly travis and the crew camilla 
Cheat, our, our, uh, our special guests, Bitcoin Chris and Bruce and P. Appreciate you guys. I'm not sure who I'm missing there, but oh, Fish, I don't recognize you when you have a headline there. Fine. Camilla, school us. Yeah, hey guys. So my article is about how Time Magazine now accepts Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions. So as a quick recap last week, Time announced that it'll be partnering with Grayscale on a new educational video series on the crypto space and that they will receive payment in the form of Bitcoin and that they'll hold the funds in their balance sheet. Well, earlier today, Time Magazine announced that it it will now accept Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for digital subscription payments. And Time has partnered with Crypto.com for the feature, which will currently only be available for the US and Canada there will be global access. Uh, It is expected to be rolled out in the next several months, and they will also keep the accepted cryptocurrencies from subscriptions and will not be converting them to fiat. So me personally, I would not use my Bitcoin to pay for a time subscription, which is probably why they agreed to accept other currencies, but that's just my opinion. I'm done speaking, John. Nicely done, Camilla. Nicely done. I think um, I think the real key question is how much time will it take for them to convert that shit that they take for subscription fees and put it into Bitcoin? That's the, the real question. Anyway, I see, I see what you did there. How much time? <laughs> oh good. yeah, That's yeah, good. dad jokes galore. You get away with that shit if you can, you know, birth a human or at least help in that process. Brecky, you want to weigh in on Time Magazine there or anyone else on stage? But yeah, I think that's really cool and bullish, Camilla. It's almost funny that that didn't make more news, um, which I found to almost be more bullish than the news itself, was my observation earlier or late last week when I think that made fine. I don't have too much to add. It is interesting, you know, kind of how it came about in this, like, almost partnership with, uh, what is it, Crypto.com, and then their, their shitcoin CRO. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we'll see more of these, these kind of things pop up. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Overall, I just love when I, – I just think it's going to be funny when, like, the New York Times is, is buying it if they're still around um, because, like, just, like, they're probably on – the Bitcoin or uh, I think it's like Bitcoin is dead. LOL, which is Rohan's new website. Um, you know, it's like, like I can't wait to all of those uh, publications and all those folks adopt, but I'm not here to pick on people. I'm here to share the news. Camilla. Thank you so much folks. I see a lot of people raising their hands. The idea here is to change your avatar to a headline from today. If you've in fact read one, um, if you haven't, please unraise your hands or just chill and, and sit back and learn. Um, Silva, I know you already contributed. Thanks for hanging out. Fish, what do you got there, man? Um, I thought this was a a fun little reminder for people uh, that might do things like risk their Bitcoin on leverage exchanges. Uh, The drop we had a couple nights ago, just that quick, uh, you know, seven, ten thousand dollar drop, whatever it was. Um, You know, in an hour, it liquidated six, uh, seven point six billion dollars. In, um, I, I think that's total crypto positions or something, but in an hour, it was $4.6 billion worth of Bitcoin was liquidated. And this is what happens when, when the market gets over leveraged one way. There's no buyers left to go long. And, uh, you know, the big guys can see that and they'll liquidate your Bitcoin. And it's a great way to lose it. Uh, so just a quick follow up question. Is that a lot? Seven six seven point six billion. Um, like you don't find that under your. Not at all. <laughs> uh, definitely not my couch cushions. That's for sure. And yeah, it's it's a lot. It's definitely one of the larger, um, quick liquidations that I've ever seen. Um, you definitely don't usually see more than that in a whole day, and that happens. To be fair, that's just cuck bucks, though. So it's not like really a lot in. Thanks, John. Appreciate appreciate you uh, uh, bringing the uh, the formality to the Bitcoin the news hour. Hey, um, I'd love to kind of open up a different discussion. Um, I've heard a lot of different um, analyses on what happened with the price. I don't necessarily like to to speculate on price, but we did have a sixteen percent correction. Um, I hate hearing my echo, um, only because I don't like the sound of my voice. 
So I'm sorry to all of you that have to listen to it daily. All joking aside, I'd love to get your guys' take on, and I've read a number of different stories. I won't pollute the airwaves here. I'd love for everybody here to contribute, whether uh, on what your take on what drove uh, um, the correction this past weekend or the, the retracement um, that started, I think, Saturday night into Sunday, if I remember correctly. But I didn't eat for three days, and I lost track of time. So I um, would love to get you guys' You just opened up a whole can of worms there, John. Um, kind of uh, my post as well. I will give us five minutes till five till four forty three. We will we shall cover the sixteen percent <laughs> discount where all we were doing was panicking to get every every bit of. F- so if yeah. you want to if you want to hit the minor fud, then look at my my picture. Um, I had a nine point about Shen's when block reward. Pardon me. Sorry, I heard about some. Power outage in China, and I think that's true. Yeah, so the power outage in China, uh, which may be inspections by the regulatory officials or something else. We're not really too sure what happened, but huge hash rate drop off on the weekend, which now um, obviously um, block times are extended, and that leads to my post, which shows that I had a 9.5 block reward this morning, which is crazy considering the block the block reward is only 6.25 bitcoin plus so if you're thinking your average block reward is now almost half a million bucks because of this because of this hash rate drop off so whether or not that contributed to the price dump um according to nick carter definitely not but who knows what happened whether uh willie Wu has a great thread on twitter where he's proposing a conspiracy theory where where the whales actually manipulated the hash rate drop to um, come offline three hours after the big or after the difficulty adjustment um, w- took place. So therefore, um, yeah, there's lots of theories floating out there, man, but whether it's leverage longs getting flushed out, I mean, everyone else can contribute much better than me. I'm just telling you what the miners are seeing here. You know what you just made me think of with that is one thing that could make sense is that, if someone were to take advantage of, of such a situation, um, the, or, or just, it naturally happens. If, if people are trying to move Bitcoin into leveraged exchanges to add to long positions, um, because they're essentially maxed out already and the block time gets longer, then it's going to take longer to, to confirm those transactions into the exchange and go long. So that makes and, huge sense, man, because three hours after the difficulty adjustment, all that hash rate come offline, the, the miners in China got shut down. And then there was like something like, I don't know how many not thousands of Bitcoin moved onto Binance, onto the exchange to get ready for the flush, right? Yeah, it's it's an interesting possibility. Um, and, you know, when I think the block times went up to about 14 minutes rather than 10 minutes. And, you know, that's enough to slow down the inflow for the, uh, the bulls trying to go long and, and allow the, and they, that were already over leveraged. And that's, that's generally just what happens in any market when one side is over leveraged and essentially all cashed out, they don't have any more to flow in then. And, and the, the, you know, the short sellers are sitting on the sidelines, just kind of waiting for that opportunity and they see it and they take it and, and the liquidation is just. Yeah, and in Hello. regards to the nine billion in liquidations, um, is that the most since March twenty twenty when the COVID thing hit, or is that the most ever? It's definitely not the most ever. Um, it's very clear to me that all of these flash crashes are happening because the RSIs on all the coins are seriously oversold. So it's just like it has to happen. Like no markets is just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Like they have to go down and up and when something goes up by like 50% or 200% like and it goes down by like 20% like that's totally normal and it just seems like a lot because of how much it has gained does that make sense and the uh, last bit I'm sure we should cut it off at the five minute mark John but there was some random tweet which I'm sure you know about but just for the audience there were some FX hedgers which isn't a legitimate news source but people somehow thought it was that tweeted that the US Treasury was going to bring charges against several financial institutions for laundering money through cryptocurrencies and um, Nick Carter has uh, posted his own news uh, within the last hour saying that there is an infinite amount of cash in the Federal Reserve according to sources so I think that pretty much sums up 
Just one thing that makes no sense about that, and I didn't catch this yesterday when Aaron and I were talking about it, but uh, the U.S. Treasury Department doesn't actually charge anyone. So that news story makes no <laughs> sense. Uh, Department of Justice. That's correct. Also, the same uh, news source said that the state of New York was going to give undocumented migrants $15,000 a piece. So it's not doing that either, and it's not doing a lot of the news that it claims. Be careful where you get your news. But yeah, we can move on. Next. That's why you come to the Bitcoin News Hour. We filter that crap for you. Sean, I think you told your story. Shannon, what's up, dude? What's going on? Oh, I think we sort of did you covered this, this a little. No, not necessarily. A little bit, but you, it's okay. You you can you can chime in. I, I think this is a little bit different than what we talked about. Yeah, so it's just the concept. I think it was uh, some sort of interview on CNBC where um, someone of authority in China said that they would. They're starting to consider uh, Bitcoin and stable coins uh, a alternative investment. So. That might mean that they're changing their good. They could potentially change their regulatory stance on how they've essentially made it. You know, you can't have Chinese cryptocurrency exchanges. You can't go from the Chinese yuan into Bitcoin legally there. Um, and so they might change some of those regulations and bring back some of those changes, which might bring back more buying volume into China. Um, so all in all, it's bullish anytime a government starts to like lighten up on the concept of Bitcoin, especially someone like China, who's been trying to essentially ban it for as long as I've been paying attention. Um, so it's good news, but it was like one word from one person. So probably more overhyped than anything else. I think they're more likely just to come out with their CFTC, call it a stable coin. And- Whenever you hear that China's banning Bitcoin, like that's always fake news. It's well, they, always going to be fake news. And even if China did ban Bitcoin, people would find a way around it. Like, it's just no, not, it is, it's not a bannable thing. It is technically thing. illegal in China to use an exchange to buy Bitcoin with Chinese yuan. But obviously, it's, they still have a massive amount of volume in which it's they... It's technically illegal to do in America, too, but, like, a lot of people do it. So there's ways around it because of the privacy and decentralization. No, it's not that illegal to buy offers. Bitcoin in America. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's not illegal to buy... Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, it's completely whoa. illegal to buy all I didn't, the Bitcoin I didn't, I didn't say... I didn't say Bitcoin. I said other cryptocurrency assets. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. Um, why don't we uh, let Michi go to her story really quickly, actually. Michi, welcome to the Bitcoin News Hour. Thanks for uh, for chiming in. Do you want to share your story? Okay. Anybody else want to comment on Shannon's story before we go to Rob and Joe? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to mute it up. Oh, no worries. Just, yeah, I didn't know if you were. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Feel um, free to share your story. So, yeah, um, it just says after a wild weekend, Bitcoin could take a breather before the next move higher. Like, um, I definitely think it will take a breather for sure. And um, I don't think that people should panic about it because when you – like I had mentioned the RSI earlier, which is a technical indicator. And, I mean, this RSI goes from oversold to undersold. And pretty much we're going to have to wait for the daily RSI to go back down to undersold. It's only about like halfway there now. So like people aren't going to start buying again until it goes low enough where people feel comfortable to buy. So I think that we're going to keep going down a little bit, but I think it was just totally normal. But the headlines just make it so like they just they just make it seem so scary. And I don't think it's right. Yep. Usual FUD. I'm still buying. Yeah. There's an army of webs out there buying every day. I, I don't so. really – you know what's yeah, funny, Brecky? I actually never look at the RSI. I just look at how much cash I can have and how quickly I can throw it into my salon account. <laughs> but, yeah, I it's uh, that, it's I always cute that. when – it's always the cute R- when the – go ahead. I'm sorry, Michi. I, I, but we, I don't really trade, and I think a lot of people well, um, in I'm this room don't really Well, I'm just saying, like, trade. there's – yeah, but there's just like the, these two indicators, the RSI and the volume, are such simple indicators. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with what um, they are. I don't want to go, like, just because we only have 13 minutes to cover the news, I just yeah, really want to yeah, focus definitely. in on the Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely not trying stores. to like, teach it to you or anything. I'm no, that's okay. They're simple and they could really help your, help your game, that's all. So, you know. My, my, my game is unhelpable, it's unfallible, which is why I use the cheat code called Bitcoin. And it just does this 200% year-over-year thing, and, and I'm not even that good at math. I just kind of count on it doing it. But all joking aside, 
Welcome back to the Bitcoin News Hour. We cover as many news stories as we can in an hour. We do this Monday through Thursday. I'm your host, John Fukori. I don't know much about Bitcoin, so I have to lean on all my friends here, and we all kind of help each other to get caught up on the news, cheat and catch uh, catch each other's notes, if you will, if we miss class. So um, I think we left off at Rob. I think we lost Joe. Oh, no, I see you, Joe. I just – uh, PTR there. Rob, before you tell your story, if anybody else wants to get on stage really quickly, feel free to raise your hand. But before you do, please go ahead and uh, uh, change your avatar to the headline that you've read. Um, give us about a one or two minute explanation on the key points. Um, and really quickly, Mike, just because we covered that story, I think twice last week on a on 11 nightclub, which I promise I've never been to, um, um, I might ask you to either change your story if you have another one. Or I might uh, might ask you to move back to the audience, but Rob, welcome back. What do you got for us, man? Hey, John, thank you so much for you and Brecky for organizing the room, and thanks to everybody for uh, participating. Uh, Bloomberg put out an editorial, kind of the latest in the series of what I described to be kind of specious editorials about how Bitcoin's peak has already been reached. Because a company that trades in part in Bitcoin or is an exchange of Bitcoin is worth almost, what, 80 to $100 billion. I thought it was pretty ridiculous. And I think that something with over a trillion dollars invested in it uh, has much further to go. Um, but I've seen a series of these editorials by Bloomberg, and I have to say I'm really disappointed by it. I also think that it's a major disservice to uh, their readership. Uh, considering a lot of those folks are on Wall Street or maybe they're casual investors. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is we, we have these casual journalists who, who have a very surface understanding of, of what's going on here. You know, when uh, when companies start adopting Dogecoin as their treasury reserve asset, then may, maybe I'll believe Bloomberg, but uh, I, don't, I don't see that day coming in. Couldn't agree more. You know, today on Chicago News Radio, um, uh, uh, CBS News Radio, they they said, and I quote, "Man, Bitcoin, or excuse me, Bitcoin and, and crypto markets, um, which make me you know cringe and, and quite frankly have a gag reflex. Um, they now trade on the weekends. It's a twenty four hour trading thing now. Like as it, as though this was like a new thing. I, I almost I almost had to like slam the brakes. Um, I, I was shocked. I literally couldn't even think. I'm like, oh my god, these guys are just like, there, there's no chance. They got no chance." Anywho, anybody else want to chime in on that? Oh, so, yeah, it's just good. Like, I never read the op-ed pages of any publication, to be honest. Like, I never read the opinion page, no third-party contributions. I just try to stick to, like, the actual newsroom reporters. So that'll keep your, you know, emotions more even when you don't have to, like, look at opinion articles contributed by third-party people. And you can just actually follow the news. It's a lot easier on your emotions. And it also reminds you that you're so early to the game, man. <laughs> like people with a lot of money don't know a lot about a really, 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 really important asset. Wait, I can buy on the weekend? <laughs> what? It is now a 24-hour market. I really wanted to just like tweet at them and be like, so now as in when? <laughs> hey, folks, I just wanted to give a quick welcome to American Hoddle up to the stage in case uh, – he has any any commentary on uh, on the rest of the headlines as we close out the hour. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Otto <laughs> doesn't do mainstream media. Sorry. <laughs> I like to read just the headlines. I never read the stories. Have you finished getting through all the avatars yet? Let us know. Joe. So. Can somebody like um, enlighten me on the issue here? Is it that just the the media is putting down Bitcoin and that is bothering people? It's never changed. Yeah, so uh, it's definitely always been like that, and you just kind of like gotta gotta deal with it and just have faith and like really. Mister, there is there is no you issue. Believe in it. There, there isn't there is actually an issue. issue. You're you're. I mean, I I am trying to help. I'm trying to engage oh. the conversation here oh, but I, well, I don't think there's actually an issue either i'm not like angry or anything i'm just talking i'm sorry yeah well, just, it, it's all good yeah, yeah yeah no i mean i gather yeah. the passionate nature in your monotone voice so i it, it's really it's really throwing me but joe why don't you go ahead and check in and would love to get your story and your take on the on the story if you couldn't in, in one day. 
Sure. Um, so this is actually uh, kind of runs counter to what Aaron was just making, which is a sound point to always read the news as opposed to the opinion pieces. But I did want to share it because I think it, it will spark some interesting debate. It is uh, an opinion piece, actually, that was published in The Washington Post by their lead uh, economics and um, business and public policy columnist, Megan McArdle. And the title of the piece is After Eight Years, the question remains, what's the point of Bitcoin? Um, aside from the fact that it's you know factually wrong in its title, it's Bitcoin's existed a lot longer than eight years. Um, it's a remarkably bad take, and there's uh, it was shared um, by some sources, you know, ten thousand plus times on on some social medias. And the one thing I, th I caught out um, that stuck out, excuse me, from the the um, the remarkably bad take, which is not really worth your time, but it's this uh, explanation about how, you know, all these skeptics have been wrong for eight years on the price. And most of the uh, Bitcoin uh, ardent believers push back and say, well, price will always go up. And I'm just going to read a quick section here. Uh, it says, uh, where it says, um, sorry. Um, most of the value of Bitcoin has accumulated in the past 12 months, as well as the price increase almost tenfold since April of 2020, yet underlying that value of Bitcoin's real world, non-speculative, non-hobbyist use are such things as transferring money out of countries with currency controls or detailing in certain illicit goods. Uh, in these contexts, it looks less like a currency uh, than a substitute for expensive jewelry, uh, something small, reasonably durable, and highly valuable, which is relatively easy to move across borders. Uh, it goes on to say basically that all value is uh, uh, collective hallucinization. And then it says, basically, you know, we're going to look at this market. How possibly large can it grow? Most people can appreciate the gleam of gold. Possibly fewer can appreciate the austere intellectual charms of Bitcoin's payment architecture. That could leave Bitcoin ownership confined to a few countries and a relative handful of tech-savvy aficionados. And if the aficionados have actually been betting on some wider appeal, then eventually uh, we might see the price crashing back down to earth and the skeptics vindicated at long last. So basically more of the same, despite all of the advancements, despite all of the institutional adoption, we've still got a lead columnist for the Washington Post telling all of her readers, thousands of people sharing this article, that I'm still going to be right in the end, even though I've been wrong every single point. For Yeah, it's just columns, op-eds, opinion articles, third-party con contributions. They're so infuriating. It's newsworthy in itself, though. The fact that people, even to this day, do not even acknowledge in mainstream. And this isn't like, you know, I know some people think the Washington Post is trash. I don't. Um, I think a lot of the stuff needs to be taken with a grain of salt and it's, it's, you know, give it what it is. But it is a mainstream publication. And even at this point, with major companies purchasing, we still have folks that are, you know, giving these remarkably bad takes. Is that's um, I wanted to just go back to um, uh, someone said that someone t said on their news article that Bitcoin had hit a top. They felt that Bitcoin had hit a top. And I just what I wanted to point out that is really different about now and all the other bull runs is that now there's only 19 million Bitcoins left. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. There's only 2 million Bitcoins left. There's 19 million in circulation. So there's only 2 million left out of 21 million. So, like, I don't see why anyone would think that it wouldn't keep going up. There you have it, folks. Ben, welcome to the stage. Thanks for uh, joining the Bitcoin News Hour. Got about four or five minutes left. We'll try to cover the rest of these stories and uh, wrap up for the day. Ben, what, what do you got there? I see a chart and uh, would love to see if there's some news story behind that or what do you share in there? Yeah, not really. My screen news. won't even let me zoom in on your screen right now. I'm getting a server error, so I really can't even see what that is. I just see some <laughs> orange and red in an unzoomed fashion. No worries. Yeah, it's um, about two days ago. Some of you guys might have seen it on Twitter. Uh, not really a news story, but a chart that was put out by um, somebody who knows more than me. But basically just showing um, the peeps after each halving, um, the, the peeps uh, in, in the price. Um, and it's showing that we're basically just in the cool down period after the first peak um, of the of this last having, 
Um, and the, the, I don't know if you can see the axis, the Y axis, but it's logarithmic. Um, you can see it's at 60K right now. And if we're at the peak or if we're at the cool down of after the first peak, um, then you can kind of imagine where the top is from here. I, uh, I just retweeted the, the chart if you want to go to my Twitter and, and actually see it. Yeah, Ben, that's great. Those are all on-chain metrics. So if you have a Glassnode account, you can look at a lot of those. And it's also consistent with, the, I think, one of the um, news hours we had last week where I shared a, uh, some data that shows that for the first point, over uh, 14,000 long-term hodlers based on identified wallets are actually accumulating rather than selling, which is amazing. The fact that, you know, we've been long-term hodlers, uh, at least by the metrics used, used by Glassnode, have been selling this entire rally all the way up through, you know, 64K, and now they're accumulating for the first point. Um, so T, what's going on? I need some, some inspiring and bullish news. And of course, T bounced. Oh. So there goes that. Well, he, he left us. He got, he got Trojan horsed. Michael, is that a news story? I've seen that as your avatar for like four days. So if it's not a news story, no big deal. But I can't zoom it, in it, on people's photos. Go for it, man. Share what it is. Yeah, so I guess it's a bit tangentially related to Bitcoin. Oh, now I can. SPAC what, wipeout. Got it. Yeah, so that's sort of your alternative, the stock markets and, and what you get there. And if you look at what SPACs are, um, a, a key reason they exist is it allows people to have valuations based on revenue projections five years out into the future. So it's these startups that have a tiny amount of revenue today, but they put a hockey stick growth and then they say, this is what our revenue will be. Therefore, we should be worth a few billion dollars. And, and normally when you go public, it's not possible to do that. Uh, and a public company is, is essentially a, a way of getting closer to the money printer because corporations that are public can access cheap debt that other companies can't. And so what we're seeing is that more and more of the monetization of the stocks where you take lousy companies, you have essentially an influencer them off, pumping those stocks up, and then they crash back down to the point where the stock market is sort of resembling the shitcoin casino to a large extent and it's not a secure way to store there you have it folks michael shapiro recapping the great definancialization by the great parker lewis the next mayor of austin texas perhaps where the citadel might be built Stay tuned for the next episode of the Bitcoin News Hour to find out more about that and other stories. Let me kick it to my esteemed partner, Brecky, with the Bitcoin News Hour. What a show, folks. Thank you to everyone who contributed and to everyone who listened in. Don't forget to join Cafe Bitcoin by clicking on Cafe Bitcoin at the top left of your screen. And remember to find our full schedule of events at cafebitcoin.club. We hope to see you again next time for the Bitcoin News Hour.